In March 2023, the Japan Forum for Strategic Studies, a private Japanese think tank, sponsored a two-day, real-life Taiwan Strait Crisis Policy Simulation in Tokyo. The purpose of the simulation was to examine the challenges of Japan's government response to a Taiwan contingency by China. This video provides an easy-to-understand explanation of the event. Before explaining the simulation, let us briefly explain the geopolitical importance of the region and the basics of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. The Taiwan Strait is an important sea area located between mainland China and the island of Taiwan. This region has long been a source of tension between China and Taiwan. Although China considers Taiwan to be part of its own country based on the One China Principle, Taiwan enjoys substantial independence and its status is subject to varying international views. Meanwhile, the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty was signed in 1951, and has undergone several revisions before taking its current form. The treaty includes the provision of military support by the U.S. in the event of an external attack on Japan. In addition, the U.S. is allowed to use military bases in Japan, which plays an important role in the security of the Asia-Pacific region. In this video, we explore these background scenarios and how Japan and the U.S. would respond if military tension were to escalate in the Taiwan Strait. Although we have tried to explain the terminology as clearly as possible, we will explain each technical term again. Japan Forum for Strategic Studies it conducts research and makes policy recommendations on Japanese politics, economy, and security. Taiwan Emergency The term Taiwan contingency is a Japanese expression referring to an emergency situation concerning Taiwan, especially a military conflict or crisis. One China Principle China's policy of regarding Taiwan as part of its own country. Although Taiwan has a virtually independent government, China internationally claims Taiwan as one of its own provinces. U.S.-Japan Security Treaty A security treaty between Japan and the United States that was concluded in 1951 and has been revised several times since. It commits the U.S. to provide military support in the event of an external attack on Japan. Unmanned aircraft Drones and other remotely controllable aircraft. In military applications, they may be used for reconnaissance or attack. Airborne Brigade A unit that descends from the air to participate in combat. Usually paratroopers or helicopters. We assume that China attacked Taiwan's early warning radar and other systems with drones and then launched ballistic and cruise missiles targeting communication facilities and other targets. Chinese forces then landed from several ports in northern and western Taiwan and launched an invasion. An airborne brigade has been dropped on a civilian airport, but has been held back by a severe Taiwanese counterattack. Against this backdrop, a Chinese spokesperson warned the Japanese government that if it allowed U.S. support or the use of U.S. military bases in Japan for operations to attack Taiwan, it would be considered a military action against China and all of Japan would become a military target. In response to the Chinese suggestion of a military attack on Japan, the Japanese government's decision was to use the U.S. bases in Japan as requested by Taiwan. The government's response was to respond to the situation, which is now so tense that there is no telling when this situation may affect our national contingency. For its part, Japan has decided to allow the U.S. military to use these bases because of Article 6 of the Japan-U.S. Security Treaty itself. We have made this decision in the sense that this will also serve as a deterrent. In accordance with Article 6 of the Japan-U.S. Security Treaty, Japan announced that it would accept the use of U.S. military bases for the purpose of defending Taiwan. And at an informal meeting between Japan, the U.S., and Taiwan, further requests were made. As you know, the Taiwanese Air Force runway had already been destroyed, and there was talk of a desire to use the Japanese side or a U.S. military base in Japan as a landing site for airplanes flying overhead. The meeting also later discussed cooperation between Japan and the U.S. and what decisions the Japanese government would have to make if a Taiwan contingency became a reality. In the scenario you have just viewed, we have set up an invasion in which Chinese troops have landed and invaded from several ports in northern and western Taiwan. Furthermore, the simulation will begin with a situation in which an airborne brigade has been dropped into the Taoyuan International Airport located approximately 30 kilometers west of Taipei. Generally, 
Taiwan is considered to be difficult to land on because of the mountain range to the east, and an attack from the west is expected. We believe that the Chinese military's landing operation scenario this time is actually deployed in a manner similar to this situation. Taiwan has a mountain range running through the middle, and air force bases and other facilities are located along this range. Tunnels are dug into the mountains and aircraft are hidden there, but the mountains make ballistic missile attacks from the continental side very difficult. Therefore, the Chinese military must deploy carrier strike groups to attack, as well as submarines and other vessels for defense. Generally, the Chinese Navy draws such a diagram and points out the beaches in this area as suitable landing sites, but the northern part is often considered the point of attack. The reason for this is that when advancing long distances, they would face resistance from Taiwan, and if U.S. military reinforcements arrived in the meantime, they could be pinched off. For this reason, the northern part of the country is considered a suitable location, even if the area is heavily defended. In fact, during last year's exercise starting on August 4, exercise dues were set up in this region. This is intended to block the north and at the same time launch an airborne surprise attack on Taipei and its suburbs. Another consideration is the ports in the region. The Chinese Navy has limited troop transport capacity, making it difficult to land sufficient troops. For this reason, the strategy of using the port with large private sector ferries and other means has been adopted by the Chinese People's Liberation Army and its exercises since around 2020. However, operations to secure the port will be required before that, and the Taiwanese side has a defensive system in place to stop them, so the battle will be a tough one. Once the People's Liberation Army occupies the port, Taiwan will set up a strategy to take it back. It may be difficult to land a large number of troops at the port under such circumstances, but the Chinese People's Liberation Army is reportedly considering that as an option. This simulation showed a situation where it would be difficult to march into Taipei after landing. The focus was on what kind of support the U.S. military would provide to this situation. The interpretation of Article 6 of the Japan-U.S. Security Treaty is particularly important. He explained that Article 6 of the Japan-U.S. Security Treaty stipulates that the U.S. is allowed to use facilities and other assets in Japan for the security of Japan and peace in the Far East, and that the use of bases for combat operations by the U.S. military requires prior consultation between the U.S. and Japanese governments. In this simulation, he warned that if China allowed Japan to use U.S. bases in Japan for U.S. support and operations to attack Taiwan, it would be considered a military action and all of Japan would become a military target. After receiving a warning, the person playing the role of the prime minister decided that in this simulation, the use of U.S. military bases in Japan would be permitted after consultation between Japan and the U.S., based on Article 6 of the Japan-U.S. Security Treaty. The difficulty with this decision lies in the need to take necessary measures to protect Japan's security and peace in the Far East despite the warning from China. It can be said that the decision to allow the use of the U.S. bases was a critical decision for Japan, and the difficulty was the potential escalation of military tension that could result. The most difficult aspect of this simulation was the issue regarding the use of U.S. military bases in Japan. Normally, these bases are used to fight the enemy in the event of an attack on Japan, with U.S. aircraft and ships deployed for joint defense. However, in a situation where Japan is not under attack, the launching of attacks from these bases against other countries that have not yet fought Japan is actually stipulated by the exchange of notes between then Prime Minister Kishi and Secretary of State Harter at the time the security treaty was signed, which stipulates that there is consultation with the Japanese side. This point shows the difficulty of complex decisions in the simulation. In this simulation, Japan had not yet been attacked, but U.S. forces in Japan were to be mobilized from bases in Japan to fight China in support of Taiwan. The decision to allow the use of this base was a very heavy one. There were considerable threats from the Chinese side, and there were many voices of opposition in Japan as well, asking why the U.S. would use a Japanese base to go to war with China to help Taiwan when Japan was not under attack. This situation forced the Japanese government to make a very difficult decision. This scenario also depicted a situation where the local Okinawan media reported that the U.S. military was planning an attack from Okinawa, leading to an opposition movement. A decision not to allow the use of U.S. bases in Japan while Japan is not yet under attack would prevent the use of U.S. forces in Japan to launch an attack against China in support of Taiwan.
This would result in U.S. forces moving from Japan to other areas such as Guam, leaving U.S. bases in Japan empty. The next time Japan is attacked, the problem arises that there will be no stage for joint defense. Therefore, in this scenario, Japan was forced to make the difficult decision to accept the use of U.S. military bases. Explaining the situation to the public was very important for the defense of Japan. Since the expression, we must have U.S. forces in Japan because we will be hit next, was too sad, the person playing the role of the prime minister took a different approach. He explained that the presence of U.S. forces in Japan itself would put great pressure on China to mobilize from bases in Japan to support Taiwan in a situation where war had not yet broken out. He believed that this might cause China to think, now that the U.S. is out of the picture, and either stop fighting and pull back or move to talks. From the perspective of this certain deterrence, we made a decision this time based on Article 6 of the Japan-U.S. Security Treaty to use U.S. military bases in Japan. This is probably the first time that this serious situation has been considered in Japan. In response to the question of how Japan viewed the heavy decision at a stage when it was not under attack, I think it is appropriate to apply Article 6 of the Japan-U.S. Security Treaty. This is signaling, and if Japan shows a posture of backing down when China threatens to do so, China may apply more pressure. Since there is a possibility that it will take another action while making that threat, I believe that at this stage, Japan needs to clearly show its intention to the other party that it is prepared to do this. It is important to note at this stage that China has not yet launched an armed invasion. Japan needs to know at what stage and on what scale the U.S. will conduct an operation. Japan also needs to let the U.S. and Taiwan know how much Japan can do, what decisions it can make, and whether it intends to do so, if Japan or Taiwan makes any requests of Japan. Tabletop exercises and wargaming simulations will verify this. In this context, the point of threats on the part of China becomes particularly important. There have been warnings that if the use of a U.S. military base is allowed for an offensive operation against Taiwan, China will consider it a military action and regard all of Japan as a military target for attack. In other words, the flight of U.S. military aircraft from a U.S. base itself could be viewed by the Chinese as a declaration of war. This is a situation that requires Japan to make a very important decision, and a careful response is needed. In this situation, there was a sense of alarm and concern about the possibility that Japanese nationals living in Japan and China might be perceived as hostages. In fact, many ministers expressed the opinion that in this situation, the situation should be recognized immediately and measures such as the prediction of an armed attack should be taken. The same opinion was expressed by the person in the role of Minister of Defense. This indicates the need for the Japanese government to respond quickly and appropriately to external tensions. Under these circumstances, there was a sense of alarm and concern about the possibility that Japanese nationals living in Japan and China might be perceived as hostages. At the same time, many ministers expressed the opinion that in this tense situation, the situation should be recognized immediately and measures should be taken based on the prediction of an armed attack. A similar suggestion was made by the person playing the role of Minister of Defense, emphasizing the need for the Japanese government to respond promptly to emergency situations. The person playing the role of the Prime Minister thought it was too early to make such a situation certification. The reason is that if such a situation were to be recognized, it would clearly convey to the international community the prediction of which country Japan would fight. This would give the impression that Japan had begun preparations for war and might give the impression that Japan had initiated the war first. Furthermore, such a certification would be extremely risky because the Chinese side could take advantage of domestic laws to freeze the assets of Japanese companies, detain Japanese nationals and punish them as spies, and so on. Therefore, it was necessary to buy a certain amount of time. We asked the people in their roles as Minister of Economy, Trade and Industry and Minister of Foreign Affairs to ask Japanese companies and people residing in Japan to leave the country as soon as possible to buy us time. Eventually, we had no choice but to certify the situation as an armed attack, but the reason we bought time was that we were very concerned about the safety of Japanese corporations and individuals in China. If we immediately recognized the situation as an armed attack situation, there was a possibility that the Chinese side would detain and restrain Japanese nationals for various reasons.
This would put Japanese nationals in a hostage-like situation and also entail the risk of the death penalty, the maximum penalty under the semi-espionage law, so we had to be extremely cautious. In one scenario, there was a case in which a Taiwanese fighter plane requested to land at an SDF or US military base. The final decision was made to accept the Taiwanese military aircraft at the US military base. In the background, a situation was taken into consideration where a Taiwanese fighter plane ran out of fuel and asked for help. In this case, I believe the decision was made to allow the aircraft to land at a Japanese civilian airfield from a humanitarian standpoint. In other words, the perspective of humanitarian assistance in an emergency situation was behind this decision. This situation is complicated because the destination's request was to refuel, load ammunition, and fly fighter jets again. Since Japan is not involved in the conflict with Taiwan, which is still fighting China, providing such assistance to Taiwan could be perceived as Japan's participation in the conflict. For this reason, Japan asked the US to provide support at US bases in Japan. This is a very difficult decision to make under the circumstances and reflects the complex international relations and security issues that Japan faces. This issue has been discussed for some time, but the problem is that the US will respond first before Japan makes a decision. Since the US military is likely to accept such a request under certain circumstances, it is very important that the issue is discussed between the US and Japan before such a request is made. Furthermore, the simulation assumed that China's actions would escalate, the Senkaku Islands would be targeted, and civilians would be killed or injured. The difficulty of recognizing the situation under these circumstances is of particular importance. Amidst the assumption that a week had passed since the invasion of Taiwan by China, a massive power outage occurred in central Tokyo. In addition to large-scale power outages in the service areas of Tokyo and Kyushu Electric Power Company, power plants in various areas experienced emergency shutdowns. In addition, cellular phone companies experienced communication problems. In the territorial waters of the Senkaku Islands, a Chinese maritime bureau ship attacked a Japan Coast Guard patrol vessel and Chinese nationals illegally occupying the Senkaku Islands landed on the islands. These acts should be considered an act of aggression against the Senkaku Islands, which are our territory. We believe that this situation should be recognized as an armed attack situation. The Japanese government analyzed that China has begun construction of military facilities on the Senkaku Islands. Japanese territory, and has installed anti-aircraft anti-ship missiles. China then launches a large-scale missile attack on U.S. military and self-defense forces bases in Kyushu and the Nonziai Islands. Japan attempts to intercept with Aegis ships and Pac-3s, but a wave of Chinese ballistic and cruise missiles causes launch leaks, resulting in civilian casualties. The ground, maritime, and air self-defense forces are doing their best to respond. Although we have been able to acquire certain transwar capabilities over the past five years, we need to look at counterattack capabilities as well. Japan will hold an emergency summit meeting with the United States to express its willingness to acquire counterattack capability. First, the Japanese government would like to start by asking the US for full-fledged assistance on the basis of Article V of the Security Treaty. It is also important that Japan and the U.S. jointly discuss the use of a counterattack capability and request the U.S. to cooperate in this effort. A counterattack on the mainland is a very important decision leading to escalation, and we believe that several days are needed to hold the NHK summit meeting in the U.S. under these circumstances and to determine the final goal. Through this process, Japan will be required to establish a policy to deal with the complex security environment in cooperation with the international community. While the United States may not yet be directly attacked, Japan has already suffered an attack on its territory, which includes U.S. military bases in Japan. This should be judged as an attack against the U.S., and the summit meeting, held at Japan's request, concluded that it would take some time for the U.S. to exercise its counterattack capability. In the meantime, it was decided that Japan would take the lead in exercising its counterattack capability and that Japan and the U.S. would proceed in the direction of a joint response, including targeting. Under this policy, Japan and the U.S. will need to cooperate to deal with security challenges in a prompt and effective manner. The simulation included a number of elements. First, there was a scene in which the person playing the role of the prime minister was cautious about certifying the situation. In the simulation, 
China intensified its cyber attacks, which resulted in massive power outages in the service areas of Tokyo and Kyushu Electric Power Company, communication problems with mobile carriers, communication problems with patrol ships in the Senkaku Islands, and the severing of undersea cables to the Sakishima Islands. The Ministry of Defense considered these cyber attacks as signs of the start of an armed attack and requested the Prime Minister to certify the situation as an anticipated armed attack situation. However, the person playing the role of the Prime Minister made the decision to choose the response that could be taken within the existing legislation. This simulation illustrates difficult decision-making in a real and complex security situation. In the event of a disruption or destruction of our critical infrastructure, it is natural for the Ministry of Defense to request that the situation be recognized as an anticipated armed attack. However, the role of the Prime Minister has foregone this request. In fact, the Defense Ministry's view seems to be correct. Normally, there would be a cyber attack before leading to a block attack, and there would be prior actions such as the severing of undersea cables. These can be seen as a series of steps leading up to an armed attack and are very important signs. However, the decision by the person playing the role of Prime Minister indicates a more cautious approach, and is an example of a difficult decision in an emergency situation. If Japan recognizes the situation as an anticipated armed attack situation, rather than a situation where missiles are externally launched and attacked or Japanese ships are attacked, there is a risk that Japan will be considered to have taken action first. Regarding Article 5 of the Japan-US Security Treaty, there is a perception that the US will protect Japan, but this is ultimately a decision for the US government. The US Congress and the people of the US also make decisions and move to protect Japan by putting their own citizens at risk. In this simulation, we were mindful of strategic communication, communicating which side was the aggressor, what kind of aggression was taking place, and our stance on seeking support. Only then will the security treaty actually work. In the meantime, the Japanese government took various actions against China, urging Americans and Japanese in China to leave the country as soon as possible, moving as many Japanese as possible to the mainland, and so on. The simulation revealed that the risk from attacks and vandalism to critical infrastructure was significant. It was important to communicate to the international community that Japan was under attack and to emphasize that Japan was the victim in order to gain support. Therefore, we had to endure and respond to this situation. Furthermore, the simulations also envisioned a situation in which Japanese Coast Guard personnel would be killed or injured. A Chinese fishing boat that had entered territorial waters would land on the Senkaku Islands because of engine failure, and the crew of a Chinese maritime bureau vessel would also land for protection purposes. The Chinese vessel was depicted as locking out Japanese law enforcement from the waters in the area and starting reclamation work and other activities in the Senkaku Islands. When we look at the situation where a Coast Guard ship was fired upon by a Chinese maritime bureau ship, killing and injuring many Coast Guard officers, we believe that this is an element that should go into the recognition of the situation. Finally, the Japanese patrol boat was also recognized as an armed attack situation when it was attacked. The most significant point is that a Chinese naval vessel under the command of the Chinese People's Liberation Army attacked with a 76mm gun, causing damage to many Coast Guard and self-defense fleet vessels. We made it clear to the outside world that although we called ourselves the Maritime Bureau, we were in fact a warship under the command of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. At this point, the Japanese maritime police were attacked and sunk by Chinese warships, and at the same time, Chinese militias were occupying our territory. Based on the external facts of the incident, from China's firing on a patrol vessel operated by the Japanese self-defense forces to the quelling of the situation, it was clearly determined that it was China that had disrupted order on the high seas. Therefore, the Japanese side recognized the situation as an armed attack situation, and at the same time, based on the application of Article 5 of the Japan-US Security Treaty, made a request to the United States for joint defense. This decision indicated that an act of aggression by China posed a direct threat to Japan's security, and an appropriate response based on international law was required. In various cases, the timing of when and how to certify a situation is a critical decision for the administration. I believe that the person playing the role of the Prime Minister also faced a serious problem in this simulation.
simplifying the situation determination, the decision must take into account the safety of Japanese citizens, especially those in the Nonziai Islands and Okinawa, and the risk of approximately 100,000 resident corporations in China being taken hostage, as well as the possibility of the death penalty, the most serious penalty under the semi-espionage law. Weighing these factors in the balance is indicative of the difficulty of making a real policy decision. The decision on when to recognize China as an enemy is very important, but I think it is important to decide at what point to do so. It is also a race against time, and this time it took about a week. Diplomatic negotiations are also an important factor, such as how much can be handled during that time and whether Japanese nationals of resident corporations will be allowed out of China. At the point of heightened crisis, discussions involving the Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry are also necessary, which should be incorporated into the simulation. For example, the simulation should include guidance on how to respond at the highest level of danger, such as in Ukraine, how to act in light of the Chinese government's reaction, and how Mati can protect employees of Japanese companies. It is hoped that these elements will be incorporated into the next simulation to deepen the discussion. The simulation also included an important Japanese business figure who is particularly active in China. That person appealed to us to avoid a confrontation with China, citing our current economic difficulties as the reason. However, in light of the situation in which our Coast Guard and Self-Defense Force personnel were killed and wounded, and our territory was being violated, we ultimately decided that sovereignty should be our top priority. In the process leading up to this decision, we took action by repeatedly requesting companies to move to safer locations as soon as possible. This simulation illustrates the importance of protecting a nation's sovereignty and security while taking into account the complexity of international relations and domestic economic factors. It is probably the true intention of not only governments but also companies not to confront China. That is why decisions regarding sovereignty issues are very difficult. For example, when the dispute is antagonistic, mediation may be used as a ceasefire proposal. Specifically, if there is a proposal to make Yanogani Island, a Japanese territory, a joint jurisdiction, and China agrees to it, it would effectively lose its territory. However, in this simulation, such a proposal was naturally declined because the fighting was taking place in a state of effective control. Such a situation calls for a decisive stance to protect sovereignty. It is clear from the example of Ukraine that sovereignty is the most important factor. If a country fails to protect its own territory, it may be eroded over its long history and eventually be taken over by another country. From a political standpoint, the issue of sovereignty should be a top priority. In addition, as shown in the simulation, there were occasions when the US hesitated against the ability to counterattack. This could happen in reality, and it is not clear at what stage the US would respond. Particularly with China, it is important to remain ambiguous, and strategic judgment and response are required. For Japan, if it is unclear at what stage the US will respond, it will be difficult to take appropriate action. Therefore, it is necessary to clearly understand what national goals the US has at each stage. Based on this understanding, Japan needs to formulate its own national security strategy and take appropriate countermeasures. Clear understanding and planning in both Japan's own defense strategy and in international cooperation is essential if Japan is to respond flexibly and quickly to changes in international affairs. While many Japanese citizens may think that because of the security treaty, the US will immediately counterattack or attack to protect Japan in the event of an attack, this is not the case. The US itself needs to consider how it will respond and which and how many troops it will deploy and even if it does attack, it will take a certain amount of time. There have also been reports that the US has requested that Japan deal with the Senkaku Islands, while its own country will focus on Taiwan. These circumstances indicate that Japan needs to take a more active and independent approach to its own security. Strengthening Japan's own defense capabilities and building international cooperative relationships will become more important. At every Japan-US summit meeting, there is a confirmation as to whether the Senkaku Islands are included in the scope of application of Article V of the Japan-US Security Treaty. However, in this simulation, we had a situation in which the US said, you have to deal with that in Japan.
This was because the U.S. could not afford to concentrate its forces on the Taiwan front. Japan was asked to respond on its own, but the Japanese side had considerable discussions with the U.S. from the standpoint of what the security treaty and U.S. bases in Japan meant, and the fact that the bases, which had been supported by the Japanese budget, would not be able to demonstrate their value in such a time of crisis. This exchange provided an important insight into the functions and limitations of the Japan-U.S. security system in times of crisis. The situation in Ukraine and the relationship between the United States and Japan are similar in some respects. Despite the Japan-U.S. security treaty, the U.S. seems to be trying to avoid war with China. In response to the Senkaku Islands issue, it may take the attitude, are we going to war with China for the sake of the Senkaku Islands? Also, in a scenario where Japan was actually attacked, there was a situation where Japanese territory was under attack and when Japan consulted the U.S. about exercising its counterattack capability, the U.S. was told that it would take time to prepare and hold an NSC meeting. This illustrates the important question of what position the U.S. will take in the Japan-U.S. security arrangement, and how Japan will act to protect itself. At this time, the person playing the role of the Prime Minister argued that the U.S. mainland may not have been attacked, but Japan is now under attack. He appealed that Japan must fight back, and that this is why the Ministry of Defense and the Self-Defense Forces have existed until now. After two direct talks with the U.S. President, the U.S. responded, all right, let's do joint targeting between the U.S. and Japan. However, since the U.S. counterattack missiles were not yet ready, Japan initially decided to conduct the attack, but since the U.S. would also participate in the targeting, the U.S. would eventually join the attack as well. This exchange highlights the important issue of cooperation between Japan and the U.S. during a crisis and how each country will respond. The U.S. said it would take action when it was ready, so the person playing the role of Prime Minister viewed this operation as a joint Japan-U.S. operation. Targeting will be done jointly by Japan and the U.S., but the first action will be taken by Japan, since Japan can prepare in time to counterattack first. However, I repeatedly explained to the ministers that this was not Japan's sole action. The reason for this is that in the unlikely event that Japan were to conduct a direct attack on Chinese territory by targeting on its own, it could be viewed by China as an independent attack by Japan. This would make it easier for China to counterattack. This would make it easier for the Chinese to counterattack because it would be seen as a unilateral action by Japan and not by the US. It was important to avoid such a misunderstanding because China might estimate Japan as weak. If we do not take the form of joint Japan-US action under any circumstances, there is a possibility that, on the contrary, China's counterattack will be strengthened in response to Japan's counterattack. Based on this political judgment, Japan repeatedly confirmed to the U.S. president that Japan and the U.S. would work together, and on that basis, Japan exercised its counterattack capability. This joint Japan-U.S. stance demonstrates the importance of international coordination and collaboration in times of crisis and the need to strengthen Japan's own strategic response in security and international relations. This response highlights the importance of international cooperation and joint action, and is an important decision in Japan's security strategy. This is the end of the simulation so far. Let us now consider what is needed in the future based on what we have seen so far. Even if the scope of Article V of the Security Treaty is discussed at the summit, it will only be very broadly defined. It is not clear at what stage the US will intervene and in what maneuvers it will act. In this simulation, we have an example of a prime minister with strong negotiating skills discussing and persuading the U.S. on equal terms, but we need to consider cases where this is not the case. A strategy is needed to determine how Japan can engage the U.S. and influence the U.S. not only through words but also by demonstrating concrete actions. Such tactics are an important element that can only be achieved through simulation and are an essential part of Japan's security strategy. In the event of a contingency, it is believed that Japan and the U.S. will act together smoothly. Once a contingency is recognized, the two countries will carry out joint operations. However, the problem lies in the preliminary stage. For example, how to recognize an event such as a cyber attack may differ between Japan and the United States. This is a matter of interpretation of international law, 
and we need to understand each other's views. It is also not clear whether the U.S. would conduct an operation to gain airspace control over Taiwan in a situation such as Taiwan. In such a situation, close consultation between the U.S. and Japan, as well as advance preparation and response planning, are crucial. Communication and cooperation between the U.S. and Japan are essential for responding flexibly to changes in the international situation and for effective crisis management. If the U.S. has as a national goal the failure of the Chinese People's Liberation Army's landing operations, it is necessary to consider the possibility that Taiwan could be severely damaged and, accordingly, Japan could be attacked. This is a May hypothetical, but an important point. Therefore, it is important how to convey to the U.S. the answers to the questions of what the U.S. thinks and how Japan will respond. By making decisions not only verbally in a meeting but also through a simulation game, both sides can deepen their understanding of each other and bring different perspectives to the discussion. Such dialogues and simulations support appropriate decision-making in complex international relations and facilitate more effective communication. The importance of strategic communication is especially evident in times of emergency. Given the reality of hesitancy and the attitudes of China and the US, it is crucial that Japan responds and handles the situation appropriately in the international community and in the domestic arena. There are examples such as Ukrainian President Zelensky, who has received support from NATO and other organizations by effectively communicating to the world and calling for support. This shows that strategic communication is crucial in gaining support from the international community. Politicians need to have the ability to communicate strategically in these situations, without which the country may face great risks. This ability is an essential element in the survival and defense of a nation. The three security-related documents have increased what Japan can do, but it is important how decisions are made to utilize these capabilities and how to cooperate with other countries. For example, countermeasures against cyber attacks and the formulation of cyber codes are necessary. Regarding strategic communication, it is important to visualize information and clarify the situation. The world perceives the situation in Ukraine as tough because Ukraine has been successful in this regard. Improving these capabilities is an important element of Japan's security strategy. Improved strategic communication capabilities will facilitate international cooperation and understanding and enable an effective response in the event of an emergency. Finally, in this simulation, situational awareness was a major issue in all scenarios. The ability to make decisions required of leaders is paramount to not starting a war, maintaining deterrence, and keeping the peace. The many challenges that emerged indicate the need for greater preparedness and countermeasures going forward. Leaders are responsible for making decisions to maintain peace in the face of heightened tensions. To do so, they must seek diplomatic solutions, deepen cooperation with the international community, and enhance their crisis management capabilities. Avoiding war and maintaining peace is one of the most important tasks for leaders. That's it for today's video. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and turn on notifications. Feel free to share parts of this video as long as you provide a clear link to this video and our channel. Our goal is to spread knowledge about Japan to people all around the world, so please use this content freely. However, if you intend to monetize using our content, we may request a portion of the earnings. Using this content maliciously is strictly prohibited. Moreover, we cannot compensate for any disadvantages or issues arising from the use of this content.